knowing that there's way too much, uh, too many topics uh, to to, um, to to take on one by one, we we thought that the uh, one theme, uh, kind of a, an overarching theme of collaboration, would be one that that uh, our panelists would uh, reflect upon, uh, given given everything that we've seen and and thought about uh, what seem to be in, in your mind uh, concrete instances or things that you're imagining in terms of what what we mean by collaboration and and, and what kind of uh, form that that's going to take so I uh, I'm uh, first of all uh, welcome to all of our, our panelists uh, I welcome everyone to go read uh, bios on the website I, I won't um, spend too much time. We, we want to hear their amazing thoughts <laughs> and read about them uh, uh, as we do it. Uh, but I will invite uh, anyone that wants to uh, jump in on that question uh, to do so. Uh, I might call upon my fellow co-chair Amit maybe uh, uh, to, uh, to start us off now that I think about it. <laughs> yeah, can you please repeat the question? I was just setting up the things. <laughs> Sure, sure. Uh, just thinking, and, and this is very appropriate uh, given your keynote, uh, what, uh, be as specific as you can be, what, what, does, the, uh, what does collaboration to you uh, look like going forward? What do you see as, as kind of a new forms of promising collaboration uh, that we, given that, that we're all here at this workshop from different disciplines and, and want something um, want productive collaboration, what do you see going forward collaboration will look like? So I think as I was also hinting in my talk or even after that, that we have to identify the problem. That's the first step and the problem ident identification itself should be a collaborative process. And that we are not going to impose a problem to some collaborator, but trying to uh, said that uh, what we want to achieve, what is the goal, and then what are the key challenges we have to address. Uh, so from there, we can start the first step of collaboration, and then we have to identify the uh, all the stakeholders and, and to see what will be the right level and the right kind of uh, collaboration. And in that sense, uh, equally important is that uh, exchange of uh, information as well as experience, uh, because uh, different uh, stakeholders are trying uh, perhaps the same thing, but in a different way. They might be deploying a particular system, a particular sensor, or particular technology in a, in a different scenario, different use case, learning lessons. So understanding of uh, what we have learned as, as a community, and then trying to figure out that what is still we have to learn instead of, uh, I think it's very typical that instead of reinventing the wheel, <laughs> let us try to see what next to be done. So that's where I think collaboration will be focusing. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I guess I'd like to invite Amy, if, if you're willing to uh, jump in on the question. Uh, welcome. Sure, thank uh, you. Um, yeah, my thoughts on the question, um, and I think the talks today have been a great example of, of you know, collaboration across disciplines, particularly robotics and art. and. Um, and I love that Damoth points out this is the 25th year of this, you know, robotics and art at ICRA, which is so exciting. Um, and I think, so for me, in that context, and in any context, what collaboration is about is about deep mutual respect and, and interest um, between two people or two groups or two communities or two entities. And I think, um, for us at ICRA, what, what that means is, how, is being able to both believe and understand and work to articulate, you know, what we gain from the arts that pushes the edge of our understanding of robotics. And, um, and if we were in an artistic community, I would say, oh, what, you know, what from robotics, what principles from robotics influence how we understand art? And I think that's a really high litmus test and not every collaboration is gonna meet that. And many collaborations are more um, fun or, or, or initial forays into a new you know, interdisciplinary community. And I think at 25 years, we should really be at that point of the litmus test. We should know what principle, you know, what from art is affecting how we teach the basics of electrical engineering. We should know, you know, what, 
principles that that these intellectuals that we're con collaborating with, be them dancers or sculptors or you know these different modalities of art that we see here um, working with robots now. And so that's kind of what I think about when I think about collaboration. How do we you know, up that ante in terms of how we see the arts impacting the field of robotics and and how we see these collaborators as fully not not sometimes I think, you know, we treat art like like little frogs in a jar, right? Like we're studying these things inside these jars, but instead how we think of them as equal agents that are co-authors and co-grantee awardees and co-reviewers and, you know, are in are fully looped into the kind of machinery that makes robotics research um, go. And I think, um, so I'm curious if we can get there in the next 25 years, right? Uh, Damith may, may uh, uh, shorten that to, uh, to, to 10 years, which would mean we've only got 10 years to, uh, to, 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 do, to do that. But well, maybe we just need 25. Let's just make it 25. <laughs> Uh, Kate, Kate, yeah, you talked about kind of underestimating uh, to a certain extent uh, what would be produced at the at the at the design collaboration that you you did. I wonder if you can kind of take off from that and and, and talk about uh, the yeah. collaboration question. So my fear was when I organized the hackathon, my fear was that with the very broad range of interests that we had, that it might prove difficult to get things going on a, on a practical level because the skills were so widely varied um, but we find the collaborations work really well and I think that over the years I've I've been in played different roles in different things and there is a tendency I think what Amy just said there's a tendency to put anyone who's non-techy on a tech grant into this box of other and you see it a lot even within the computer science community where HCI is seen as being that fluffy stuff that you do you know and I've had that kind of comment leveled at me before where there it, it's seen as not essential to the process but it can be you know it can be more essential coming from a perspective of critical digital practice then you need to have that critical perspective in order to query what's being done so I think that yes I was guilty myself of underestimating what could be achieved in a in a collaboration and and certainly you know that taught me that you don't have to frame things in technical success in order for them to be a successful collaboration that the idea is the important point and you can get to the making of the idea and the and the tangible outcome further down but it's that, that idea that is really really key and we need all the voices and we can't do AI and robotics without multiple voices because no one is an expert in every part of it. And if we don't have people coming in, challenging and critiquing, then we're lost. What's, you know, we, can, we just can't do without that, those voices. Thank you. Uh, so to, to kind of continue on that theme, uh, Nadia, I, 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 uh, I'm sure I'm not alone in, among the participants in, in uh, thinking how rich the context of uh, pain uh, and, and therapeutics around pain is in terms of uh, what voices, uh, the literal voice of the person in pain, the therapists, the uh, clinicians of various types, uh, you know, that must be, a, 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 you know, have challenges that Due to time constraints, you couldn't elaborate upon. So I, I'm just interested uh, in in your thoughts. Uh, feel free to go wherever wherever you want to go with it. But uh, I wanted to turn to you next. Uh, yeah, all, all my work has been uh, always in a very interdisciplinary setting, and collaboration was critical, but always hard. And in and the study around pain, uh, the, the same was true at the beginning. So what also we said before about uh, building the respect, uh, um, started to bond with each other, understand each other, respect each other. Um, uh, there, there is always that. Uh, I think all the party in place think that the way they look at the problem is, is the right one or the important one. And uh, here that the, the situation is pretty complex. And for example, uh, working with the hospital, we took a few years to build that reassurance in, in our clinician that we were not trying to correct people movement. We were really taking on their perspective and learning from their perspective. 
And uh, once that uh, trust had been achieved, it was really rich. And, and I think it, it really led all of us to enrich our own understanding of the problem from our own perspective. We wrote a little on paper uh, that we didn't expect that we're not uh, related exactly to what to our grant in itself, but uh, clinician wrote what they learned by working with us, uh, not just about the technology, but how the process of working together brought them to reflect on how much knowledge they have implicit. Uh, also opening the new opportunity to them to consider the technology that was emerging. Um, on our side, working, uh, understanding how, the, from an academic perspective, not therapeutic perspective, how also pain is still uh, not so understood and uh, uh, split in many niches. Uh, and the sensor technology somehow bring those together and enable them by working together to understand better pain. But it's it's the long journey that you need to, to do together and it needs to start with that sense of respect and trust or you need to build it. And for me, there is another important thing because I think collaboration happened on many different levels. Uh, there is, you know, we have we have a problem and everybody contribute to, 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 to solve it. But there, uh, there is another level where you build a new knowledge that is fully interdisciplinary. And uh, uh, it just uh, uh, come out, emerge from that collaboration that is not within the discipline. And, and it also brings to look at problem uh, in a very different way and to, to, to identify also new, new opportunity, new, new problem. So it's interesting how there is that uh, different level at which the collaboration occur. And we work a lot with patients and uh, with uh, not as an HCI person, not just with patients, but uh, all the stakeholders. And it's very interesting of learning uh, Thing from from their point of view and integrate it and and make sure that you didn't impose uh, in your design your computer scientist uh, view, but you take that on. And for me, that's also an enrichment that come uh, through that collaboration that really change your way of thinking. Uh, I, I like a quote that was sent before and and the present in a, in a key note. Uh, that, you know, start from one point and you end up with something completely different that you didn't. And I think that's what happened to our work. We started as a computer scientist, we wrote a grant with uh, looking at the technology that was there for rehabilitation and just adding emotion. And we end up to really revisit and rethinking what uh, rehabilitation is. Uh, and that happened only because there was an interdisciplinary collaboration taking place. Well, thank you. Yeah, that's um, a lot. A lot to follow up then on there, and I and I want to uh, turn to Louis Philippe just because your projects, I think, uh, really push on that idea of trust and and the the time scale that Nadia just mentioned of the, you know, the long journey that you may need to have in trust. It would seem you know, in some of your projects, there are differing timescales uh, in terms of being able to put on uh, a production, put on a performance in a way, uh, um, instantaneous certain relationships between uh, a robot touching a person. So um, I would love for you to continue the, the, the thinking on collaboration from your perspective. Uh, this is a, a very, uh, I would say, complex issue when you're, uh, let's say for myself, for instance, because I have to deal with this from may maybe a few perspectives. Let's say there's part of me who just want to do art without the, let's say the academic side of it and the contribution that it does. So that's already a big, not a big schism, but uh, sometimes you have to mitigate. Uh, and and for, for instance, like, you know, I agree with everything that's been said somehow, like, you know, collaboration power and, and the benefits and so forth. Yes, sure. Uh, 
but if I if I'm being very selfish, you know, if I look at this like, am I able to make a good artwork within a collaborative academic context? That's a big question. I won't answer it. I don't want to <laughs> make enemies. Uh, but at this, but for me, the other question is like, when I make an artwork, am I making something that I just want to throw out in the wild, or I want to make an object that I will evaluate? to generate academic results. And these are two different reflex that I, unfortunately, because of the funding and the rational of evolving in the academic world is very difficult to align together. I cannot be a full-time artist saying, okay, I don't just wanna do Inferno. And because a lot of these things you have to do, you do it through arts council and then you bring it back to say, okay, I gotta publish, I gotta, you know, and then it's really hard to do the both at the same time. Sometimes it will happen. I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm just saying that it's, it's a very different reflex because uh, I don't think an artwork should be necessarily like an experiment or something you evaluate people with. It's something that you can observe as well, but it, it's a very different construction as well because you have to have like hypotheses and, uh, and so on and so forth. And if I go back to uh, the bias that we all have around the table, of course, you know, like this is a, <laughs> this is a, a fundamental issue. And then, you know, probably the one who pulls the blanket, the strongest will maybe is the lead PI or the one has the most money and, uh, or all kinds of incentives, uh, uh, you know, but I'm in the seat of, let's say from the art side, you know, it's, we, we, we don't really have much say when it comes to uh, certain context. So you're lucky if you can uh, uh, apply this, but, but I think it's, uh, I think this is slowly evolving. I've been, I've been doing art and technology in academic context for let's say almost uh, 25, 30 years. And maybe at one point the, um, let's say the performance evaluation and the funding scheme is gonna morph a bit and then it's gonna be able to enable and through interdisciplinary thing. And I think th these things, they happen in other fields, you know, like business school, they have to deal with this engineering with spin-offs. It's very, very similar construction. So, um, um, but again, you know, like for me, I just, uh, I, I, I like things when things emerge out of chaos. So chaos needs a lot of voices and, and, uh, and this is what would happen is like, you, you just constantly have to generate permutation of what you perceive, what you can think is possible. And I think as an artist, that's, that's what you do. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's, your, it's your main work to make uh, uh, ideas clash. And then if it happens in context, then yeah. that's what happens. Yeah, I, I appreciate you, you know, surfacing that, that um, reality that sometimes vision uh, like, you know, you voiced around just, just wanting to make the art, not necessarily having a, a whole, you know, orchestrating, you know, different institutional academic, you know, features that there, that there is that impulse uh, and, and yet having that chaos impulse as well, you know, to, to, to. Or, or simply like, you know, when the, I, there's a lot of great artwork that doesn't necessarily lead directly from the author the authors of right. the artwork into their academic evaluation of this. Right. Academic evaluation comes from, let's say, like, you know, media theorists, art theorists, uh, art historians, which is, comes maybe centuries yeah. after. Uh, right. So, uh, and, you know, I mean, there's only 24 hours a day sometimes. And, yeah. <laughs> or, you know, and again, as well, I think as um, your own brain management, uh, I find myself, if I start drifting into some concerns, let's say, uh, if I go, okay, I need to think about the psychological evaluation of this or, or a technical resolution of something. And then, you know, you, you drift from other concern, even from within yourself, or it happens in teams as well and so forth. But, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right. So Ken, uh, I'm just going to kind of, we've got a lot <laughs> coming to you uh, that, that's, that's been said already, but I, I will just uh, let you um, give your, your take on collaboration, um, given, given everything that's, that's come before. 
Thank you, Thomas. Well, I, I actually, I love the topic because I, I've been collaborating all my life. And the first word that comes to my mind is exactly what uh, Amy and Nadia said, which is respect. That it, it's, a, it's a fundamental um, foundation of collaboration, as I've found. And I was, I was thinking about this in, in regard to research because it, it's very analogous. I mean, when you do research with students and colleagues, there's, it is collaboration. There's, there's usually a spark of uh, the genesis of an idea, but then it evolves very much depending on how, what's learned, how things develop as experiments come through. And you have to be very, I think a very key point of this that I'd really try and emphasize is being receptive to surprises, to changes in the progress, because you, you, if you, if you close it and, and a lot of, there's an instinct of a lot of students, uh, you know, you have this idea. I want to, I want to validate the idea. I want to make it, you know, the end the way I intended. And I, I really try and push back on that. And I say, that's not, that's not scientific. If you do that, you have to be objective. You have to come in and say, I am, I'm really open to, I'm, I'm biased as much as possible to see where it's going to lead. And that, that is, is, is so important. And it also, a big part of it is, being open, and I've, I'm always working on this myself, but being open to, to ideas coming in from others and, and giving them, in fact, soliciting that constantly every step of the way so that that all the participants feel um, engaged and, 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 and respected. So they're willing, that's essential because for them to be able to come up with ideas to really uh, contribute, they have to feel free that they won't be shot down that there will be there there is a lot of opportunity. I think one thing I, you know the points that have been made earlier about you know there there collaboration I think of is is you know in the research world, but also in the art world, it's very analogous to because in any state you're every artist has to collaborate with a an ecosystem. There's 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 a, a gallerist or a curator, and there's a uh, there's there's an audience, the critics, the there's a and 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 often there's collaborators in a studio. I mean, all major artists have have uh, have studio assistants, and you know I I I don't know that experience or that interaction, but I would imagine that it works best when the students when the studio assistants have some agency to provide input into the work. I mean that is also is super important for me as an artist, and. I, I, I'm curious if this resonates with others, but you know, every step of the way, we are looking at the work, trying to think about how it could be evolved, how it would change. I'm always asking for ideas and suggestions, and very much it's a it's a process. It's not I'm telling them, you know, do this, do this, do that, uh, because then it's then they become very, I think, shut down and closed. So. I'm always trying to create an environment where they feel engaged and excited and and respected. So I think that the best analogy to my mind is the is that in cinema, there's a concept of a director, and the director has to work with a very large set of collaborators from the from the from the actors to the writers to the to the crew to the producers, right? Every step of the way, there's so much the editor. So but the key idea is that the director, the role of a director is to direct, to essentially, as you said, Thomas, to orchestrate. And that's one thing I wanna, I'm want also curious to, to talk about, which is there has to be, I believe that one person maybe, or it's very difficult when it's just, when it comes down to two. Um, and I've been in that situation many times when there's two people collaborating and you come inevitably to a disagreement. And now you've put in all this passion into this work and you now, for you, you, you are disagreeing with your key collaborator, and you, know, you reach an impasse. So what I always try to do now is is have a very clear agreement at the very onset: is who's going to have final say, if it comes down to that. And I, I've found this with my I collaborate with my wife; she's a film director, and and she's the director; she has final say. So I will argue with her, and I will try to argue some for some point, but ultimately I'm always. The understanding is I'm going to yield to her authority on this because she's going to be the director. So 
I'm curious how others feel about that, because I think if you don't do that, and this comes back to uh, Louis Philippe's point about chaos and uh, the clash of ideas, right? And that's very important, but there has to be a resolution. And I think that receptivity to the ideas is somehow balanced with a process for resolving those disagreements. So I'm curious how others feel about that. Yeah, I, I think that's I, such an, in oh. No, go ahead. Is it is it too soon to dissolve the structure or should I wait? Absolutely time for chaos, go ahead. <laughs> Okay, I mean, I think that's a beautiful, interesting point about who has final say. And it kind of um, brings me to some of the things Luis was saying about how, you know, who has the most money, who has the funding, who has the ability to make some of these collaborations happen. And I think if you really want to like, try to do a general um, dissection of hierarchy, you could easily make the point that, you know, in robotics and engineering, we often have a lot more funding than our artistic counterparts. And inside that hierarchy of students in the lab versus tenured professors, tenured professors end up on the top of that. So I think when you think about who ends up having final say, it ends up being tenured professors who probably built their career outside of the context of interdisciplinary uh, work between robotics and art. And now, um, and now have final say in many of these collaborations, not all, but they are the ones sort of shaping this landscape and um, at least in the context of research, right? So I'm curious what kinds of things those, what kinds of additional points we would hold those people to, to make sure there's 10 more years of this type of collaboration and that it grows and, and that it becomes better. Nadia, you, you wanted yeah. to? Uh, um... I, I, I think probably my, my experience is more related to the cow situation rather than the one person directing. Of course, there is one person, there is the PI of a grant. It could be a very large grant, a smaller grant. You have somebody that has been named somehow. Um, but because of the nature of our work uh, and the importance of all the discipline that uh, have in it. So often, you know, it's not one person that finalized the decision, but it's really getting uh, everything goes well, but there are many situations which uh, you come from a very different perspective and you care about a particular point um, and, and that lead to not a discord, but, uh, you know, uh, a situation that is hard to, to solve. Um, and when it was, uh, Ken was talking about this, I was thinking to uh, my PhD student uh, that uh, they always have an interdisciplinary team of supervisor, most of them, so a clinical and uh, myself. And, you know, a, even there you have the first supervisor that in theory should be the one that uh, decide, uh, of course, is a thesis of a student and the, the student decide, but somehow, especially at the beginning, you're shaping a student. And I see how the student has to navigate between uh, and mediate a conversation between the supervisor coming from a different direction and pulling her. And somehow, in some situation, the student become uh, the, the mediator of that because he has the time to integrate the knowledge and really thinking, okay, I see the two points, how do I emerge that? Um, we found out so the patient and, and, and the physio and how to mediate that because we want to bring the good point of it inside. So it's, it's a difficult situation, but as a, through thinking, going away with a little bit of grudge and then going back, I think that process of digesting, understanding, reconsidering, are very important rather than thinking always that, okay, we need to solve and, and decide. I think there are situations in which you need to do that. Uh, and, and there is a person that often is more responsible than other. But there are, I think, the, the, uh, often what, what really emerge as a can set before you in the unexpected come from, from, from these clashes. And rather than taking a position is, uh, 
that digestion that occur and all the partner involved and then the reconsideration and and it may take time before you but I think it's a it's an interesting time and I always like with my student where I have to <laughs> make all us happy <laughs> and and uh, um thinking how how, uh, how I address this different perspective so Um, if there are any last little thoughts, unfortunately, the director of the clock is uh, especially uh, strict and um, the res resolution is coming, uh, unfortunately, quickly. I, I really well, wish we, one we thing did have I'd more like time. To, Go right ahead. So, so to Nadia's point, um, you know, I think what happens is that's actually a very good, excellent point that you as a student, I think you learn that skill, that art of of. Of, of, of engagement with the sorry that's my cat uh, with the with the the with your advisor advisors and others in in the lab and in and I would say that in effect it's a lifelong process of there's constantly always someone you know gatekeeper that you're 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 working with that you're trying to um, navigate through so I think that. I mean, I'm constant, you know, having papers rejected or proposals rejected, or there's many um, barriers that never really goes away. I, I don't, I don't, I don't complain about that. I, I find that one of the things I, I do feel though that the process of of going through it provides you with some hopefully uh, sensitivity and skill to be able to be in that position later, and then you can. Um, uh, and, and help adjudicate these these points. Uh, I think, you know, we've all probably been in this position where you're really, you, you know, at some point in the collaboration, there's a fundamental difference of opinions, and that's what I'm I'm trying to zero in on is how do you how do you resolve that because that becomes very emotional at a certain point, and I'm curious because I I think it's really important to do it in the most respectful, constructive way possible. So I'm just curious in the last few minutes if, if the others can say what what are their strategies? What are, how do they do that? I think honesty is the most important strategy. And unfortunately, there are gatekeepers who get a bigger final say than others. And I think that's on them to think about how do they facilitate rather than putting the burden on a student who has to go back and forth between two PIs and say one thing to one and another thing to another slightly different and constantly shape shift these gatekeepers need to think about that and need to create pathways for students to learn and grow and excel and be nurtured and supported and feel good and proud and healthy in their work. And honesty is the only way we'll develop those channels. What are the challenges? I love that we brought up all these challenges, right? What, what, how do we uh, go forward 10 more years? Do we keep doing it the same way we've been doing it? I, I don't think we can. Um, so it's kind of on the gatekeepers to figure that out. I, I would say that um, I agree by honesty and transparency as well. And I think that um, I, I've been involved in, in discussions around how you make a more democratic research lab. Um, there's been some lots of work on this and sort of um, sessions about it. And there are some labs that are running on this kind of basis where everyone has the same say democratically. Um, everybody's on the Slack channels from PhD students right through to the top profs and the PIs. But the thing is, you still, with the grant bodies, have to have that one person in charge. You have to have that grant assigned to API. And I think we should be moving away from this idea of the star researcher and towards this more democratic process and pushing for, for grants to not just have one PI, to be able to say everyone in this grant has an equal sharing and anyone can sign off and stuff. So I really like to see a move towards this more democratic process. But I think in the meantime, that honesty and that transparency are really key. But I guess I'm, um, I'm still pushing the question of how, how if everyone has an equal say, how do you resolve then disagreement? Compromise. <laughs> and that's the hard part because everyone's going to lose out <laughs> somewhere or another. Um, but I think that, that that you sit and discuss, and I've been in that situation once before um, where it's been particularly <clears throat> it's got quite aggressive over something and it, you know we were really and, it, and in the end we kind of conceded and said okay we've got this safe route that we can take that no one really wants to do but it's it's going to make everyone a bit happier and that 
you know, I think that there's got to be a, you've got to settle on a path. It may not, it may mean that not everyone gets their way, but at least you're keeping sort of the harmonious thing of the team. But then again, it's, it's what you want to come out with. It's what you're prepared to do with the trade. You know, are you prepared to trade something off or are you really going to stick to your guns and think that, you know, your way is the best way? So yeah, it, it, it's really, it depends what best fits the, the thing. I, I unfortunately have to uh, have the final oh. say on the time. <laughs> I'm so sorry, but I do. Uh, and, 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 and in the interest of honesty and transparency, really want to thank Caroline and Damith for the, for the amount of work and the inspiration behind this workshop. 